right. So you are the director of the LIGO laboratory. Congratulations for getting this uh, laboratory and the collaboration to, to this great discovery. Thank you. Uh, now, it seems that um, uh, the next step scientifically is to, to get a third detector. Uh, can you explain the significance of, of the of a third detector for the scientific goals? We're, what we're trying to do here is broaden the global gravitational wave network. So currently there are two detectors operating in the United States, the two LIGO detectors. They were the ones that made the discovery. Uh, there is a detector uh, under development in Italy. Uh, it's a joint sort of pan-European collaboration of uh, Italy, uh, France, Poland, uh, the Netherlands, and Hungary. It's called Virgo. And, and one of my main initiatives over the past few years has to been to move one of our detectors, actually one that's not already assembled, we're going to keep the two detectors in the United States, but assemble a third detector in India. And we call that LIGO India. And the scientific rationale for that is actually pretty simple to comprehend. It, it has to do with the fact that the more detectors you have operating, the more accurately you're able to locate a gravitational wave source on the sky. Uh, interferometers, the way we, the technology we use to detect gravitational waves, the analogy I like to give is they're, they're like microphones in the sense that they, they're not very good at, uh, one of them is not very good at picking off a direction. But when you have three or more, you can triangulate. Yeah. And when you triangulate, you can get good sky information. It turns out that where you put those detectors uh, on the Earth, all right, can vastly improve your ability to do that triangulation. And so India turns out with the, the two LIGO and the Virgo detectors, and there's also a detector under construction in Japan called Kagra, uh, those detectors give you very, very good coverage of the entire sky. And why is that important? Why do we want to localize sources? Yeah. One of the, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I mean that's that's perfectly reasonable that mm -hmm. you, you're able to spot it. Yeah. But I also think that uh, it should should uh, enhance your sensitivity in the sense that, I mean, if you have a signal, uh, a low signal to noise ratio, which might fall below threshold, mm -hmm. but if you observe the same signal with the proper time delay, a third or even fourth detector, right. it will enhance it does. dramatically your, your significance. It, 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 so one should expect much more events. Yeah. It's not dramatic. It enhances, well, it, it improves the signal to noise by the square root of the number of detectors. So if we have five detectors, all right, the, 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 our, bill, our signal to noise is improved by the square root of that, 2.25. So, so there, is, there, is a big, there is a big boost there. It's important to realize that not all the detectors are always operating all the time. So for example, with LIGO, we ran for a total of about four and a half months in our first observing run. Uh, of that four and a half months, we had about 50% double coincidence, which means there was an overlap of the two detectors operating only 50% of the time. And that's because these detectors are very sensitive, they're very uh, susceptible to uh, disruptions in their operation when the, ca the cavities unlock and things like that. Airports, so, disturbances. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, or trucks driving by, some, some, somebody uh, uh, accidentally walking onto the, the floor, the control room. So, uh, so having five detectors means that more of them will be operating all the time, and I think that's good. Let me come back to the, the, the localization point, though, because I think it's important. Uh, what we do is we pass alerts to astronomers uh, who use electromagnetic telescopes, like optical telescopes or x-ray telescopes. And by having better localization, they can then look at the same event in a different sector, the electromagnetic Finding sector. Corresponding exactly. Whatever wavelength. Exactly. And that, and, yeah. Yeah, and that could be huge. It could answer, for example, a number of fundamental questions about the origin of certain kinds of events. For example, short hard gamma ray bursts are thought to come from the coalescence, very energetic coalescence of two neutron stars. All right? But, but with this particular event, you couldn't hope for a, for an astrophysical signal, right? Because there were actually two black holes not emitting. That's, that is the conventional wisdom. However, there was a paper that was has just been uh, posted on the archive maybe about a month ago by uh, the Fermi collaboration. They operate the Fermi uh, X-ray satellite. And they have, have a hint, a hint 
of a, of a signal from our event. Now, it's uh, my own personal belief is that we would need to see more signals from more black holes uh, before we would actually have any confidence that that was a correlation, a real true correlation. But you're right, conventional astrophysics tells you that two black holes colliding should not produce any light. So the detector would, would enhance the, the much the security. Yeah. This particular event didn't didn't actually need much statistical analysis. So that was my impression. Yeah. So many people said that it was so clean that their first oh, thought it, was it, a blind injection because it looked so perfect. Yeah, yeah. What was it, that your it was a boomer. <laughs> it was it was a it was a home run. Yeah. Uh, was the, that your concern too that it or your first thought too that it might be something like a blind injection? No, uh, no, because I so so there were a certain group of people in the collaboration, myself among them, but only four people who who knew if the blind injections had actually occurred. Uh, and it turns out that we weren't ready to blind injections. So so I knew immediately that it wasn't uh, a blind injection, as did these three other people in the collaboration. Uh, the broader collaboration of about a thousand people were still curious. They still thought, well, maybe the management is, is fooling us and tricking us just to get us to start focusing on, on how to make detections with advanced LIGO. But I was not part of that. We did have a concern because the way I put it is um, this is an extraordinary claim, a detection of a gravitational wave, and extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So we wanted to check everything. And one of the things that we checked was how would it be possible for someone to surreptitiously inject a signal in that we wouldn't know about? And so somebody um, with malicious intentions. I, exactly. I call it the Chinese hacker scenario. Okay. And uh, um, no disrespect to the Chinese. Uh, the the we went through a lot of uh, tests looking at our data files to see if you could overwrite a data file, how you would be able to do that. Could you actually physically inject a signal? The way we do these injections is we actually physically wiggle a mirror, all right, so somebody could conceivably plug you know, a, a, a waveform generator into the right uh, uh, port and wiggle the mirror. So we looked at all that and we came to the conclusion that yeah, actually, if you had the right group of people, it might be possible to do it, but you need four or five people because you need to do it at both sites. There has to be signing coordination. And the only people in the world with the capability of doing it are the people that built the detector, and they didn't do it. So we ruled that out. So so we were pretty convinced that it wasn't... Uh, so how, how should I imagine? Could, could, could it be something like just a simple sound generated transmitting impact noise on the optical components? What, the, the way the signal manifests itself in the... No, I mean, I mean with this malicious uh, injection, could it be that somebody put a, put a sound generator on, on the optical table and... Yes, you could have done that. You could have put a speaker up against the vacuum chamber and, uh, uh, you know, had the right time difference, seven millisecond time difference between Livingston and Hanford. The problem, why that doesn't work, is the speakers would have to produce a very loud signal and we have microphones all over the place, so they would have picked up the, uh, that signal. Now you could then argue, well, maybe somebody could have disabled the microphones, all right? Sure, that's a possibility, but they would leave digital footprints because we log all our operational microphones. So we checked all these things to convince ourselves that, that it wasn't the case. But yeah, in the end, it turned out to be a, just a whopper of a signal. It was just, it was huge. And, and in some sense, that was, in a very real sense, that was fortunate because it was very easy to claim a detection. One of the d debates that we had internally was, you know, would we claim a detection with only one event? You know, or what, should we wait till we have two or three events? And this event was so strong and so clean that everybody in the collaboration felt we have to go public with it. Yeah. So. Convincingly. Yeah. yeah. So in general, why is it so difficult to, um, to to explain the significance of fundamental research to the public? Such fundamental research. Here? That's a very good question. I think we live in a world today where uh, we're constantly uh, exposed to new and better technologies and those new and better technologies improve our lifestyle uh, and the people who develop those technologies and the people who use those technologies uh, 
think of science as, in some sense, the font of those technologies. So, so there's a very applied, you know, people have a very applied view of science. What I think most people don't realize is that the GPS systems of today was general relativity was general relativity 100 years ago. The the iPhones of today is quantum mechanics back in the 20s. So you never know where your next great applied you know breakthrough is going to come from, which is why you need to do you know fundamental research. And I think there's there's something else that's I think fundamental and. and and the reaction to this gravitational wave detection worldwide has sort of solidified my belief in this, is that I think people are inspired by our ability to, to, to gather this kind of knowledge and to make these kind of measurements. It tells us something about the universe and therefore something about ourselves. So I think there's a, there, there, there's a, there's a natural beauty that comes from, from fundamental research. So the, the challenge, of course, is, is that fundamental research is expensive. And so you, you have to still, even though you're doing good fundamental research, make a case for it. And I, and I completely believe that, that, that we shouldn't be doing fundamental research just because it's esoteric. Mm -hmm. yeah. Even people who won't appreciate the beauty of science, so to speak, they, they still might look at the large scale of history and say, okay, that's at the very end that science had more influence that's than right. or politics or leaders or that's right. countries. That's right. That's right. And in fact, I mean, there's lots of uh, uh, studies that have been done that, that show how science impacts the economy. And unfortunately, the connections are not very tangible. It's very, it's, you know, because science is by definition sort of goes and fits in spurts, and somebody has an inspiration somewhere, and how do you, how you quantify that in an economic sense? But, but I think you're right. I think you're very right. So. Okay. So, I wish you good luck. Thank you. Next, Great. Well, Thank you very much. You, it's, it's been a pleasure. Thank you.